First of all, uh, I described this deep neural networks that was called here scattering transform, which basically does this succession of filtering nonlinear pooling through a modulus iterated. And one question is, of course, how much information do you lose by building such environments? To study that problem, what we'll look at is the inverse. Can you inverse the operator? And I'll show that you can inverse the operator. There are a lot of mathematical issues behind, but numerically uh, it does work. And there are some mathematical results explaining why you can invert and why sparsity plays a very important role here. So we'll speak about sparsity. A second topic will be textures. And texture is an interesting problem, as I said at the beginning, because it's a relatively well-defined problem of classification with well-defined stochastic processes. And then you can ask question relatively to relatively standard tools used uh, for analyzing stochastic processes. Finally, I'll be speaking about multiple invariants. Uh, most of all these presentations are about translation invariants. Uh, it's not just about translation if you want to reduce variability. You have other sources of variability, such as rotation, scaling, and so on. And much more complex other source of variability, which is the inner variability uh, of uh, objects within classes. And that last point I'll speak very briefly about it, because it's really about unsupervised learning, which is raising a lot of interesting questions. OK, so let me begin by just briefly summarizing what we uh, saw last time. Uh, the core tool behind all that are wavelet transforms. So why wavelet, as I explained, because as opposed to sine wave, wavelets are stable to deformations. So you take a wavelet, which is an elementary function, you dilate it. So in Fourier, it's going to be a bandpass filter, which is dilated, center in frequency lambda, which is going to move with the dilation. And in space, you have your wavelet dilated. And I'm going to use complex wavelets. So as I said, the wavelet transform is simply a bunch of convolutions, so a series of bandpass filters. And you also record the low frequencies. And if you do that well so that your filters cover the whole frequency axis, as I explained, you have a unitary operator. Same thing in 2D. In 2D, the only difference is that the wavelet also has an orientation tuning. So think of a wavelet as a Gaussian modulated. So it has a particular orientation. If you want to change the orientation, you have to put a rotation operator. If you rotate your wavelet, it's going to move in Fourier and covers different angles. Then, once you've rotated the wavelet, you may consider all scale, all factor to the j. So the wavelet is going to be uh, larger or smaller in space. And in Fourier, it's going to be a dilation. So the dilation will bring it here, here, and here towards lower frequency. And that's a low frequency filter. So it's like in 1D, the only difference is that there is also a rotation parameter. And then, same thing, you take your signal, you filter it with all your wavelets, and you carry the low frequency. And if you cover the whole frequency plane, you have a unitary transform. So that's the core tool that we are using all over. Then what I explained is that in order to construct invariants, you need to average. The problem is that when you average, well, you don't, sorry, you don't need to average. You can average. You can also use other operators. We discussed about that uh, for lunch, like a max. The good thing about the averaging is that it's stable. The bad thing of the averaging is that it loses information. And what kind of information it loses? The high frequencies. So systematically, you are going to grab the high frequency that you lost by doing the averaging. So the operator that is going to appear is this operator u, which is essentially like the wavelet transform, but with this rectification or this modulus. This is a complex waveform, so it's the sum square of real part imaginary part square root. So that could be interpreted as a pooling. So why do we do uh, nonlinearity? As I explained last time, you don't have the choice. You don't have the choice because if you want a linear invariant, you can have the overall average of the signal that gives you one coefficient, and that's all what you can get. 
And if you look at high frequency, the average is zero, so no information. So you have to do a nonlinearity. And this one has the good taste of being uh, commuting with diffeomorphism, with deformation. So it's going to provide you stability and to be contracted. So that's the core operator. Then what we do, as I explained, is we iterate on this operator. So you get the average, that's your first invariant. And then you get the complementary information, which are the wavelet coefficients that you rectify or you take the modulus in order to then be able to compute the next invariant. The next invariant you compute it by making the average and then computing the wavelet coefficient on the next layer. Then on the next layer, you want to compute an invariant. You apply the same operator, you average, you get your scattering coefficient which now has gone through two nonlinearity and an averaging, and the next layer. So the important element, uh, again, that I want to stress compared to uh, most deep neural nets is that the output is not going to be totally at the bottom. The output is at each layer. Each layer gives you an output. So the inside node are just the modulus of the wavelet coefficients. We'll speak about sparsity, so these can be very sparse. But the output is not sparse. The output is an averaging. However, the averaging, you can subsample it. OK, so the output will only be averages so that you get an output which is invariant. And you get the output at all layers like that. The important thing is that the energy of the last layer is going to go to 0. So at one point, you can stop. And in most signals, we basically stopped in this case, after two layers, because the third layer is already very small. OK, so now the problem of information loss. Suppose that now you only get the output, so these big averages. How much information have you lost? OK, there is a very nice reason. OK, first, to understand this problem, you have to realize we have been cascading on a single operator, which is this operator u. So if you can invert this operator u, you can cascade the inverse, and you'll reconstruct the signal. So the core question is, is this operator invertible or not? And that's where there is this nice, very nice result of PhD student uh, Irene Walsberger, who proves that this operator is invertible, not only invertible, but it has some partial stability, partial, in the sense that the inverse is continuous. So, here we are touching a very large topic. Why? What is this operator doing? It's basically losing the phase. Okay? If there was no modulus here, it would be a wavelet transform. And the wavelet transform is perfectly invertible. It's a unitary operator, no problem. So what's the difficulty? The difficulty is that you've lost the phase. And there is this belief that when you lose the phase, you are dead. You've lost too much information. And this belief is sustained by the fact that it's true for the Fourier transform. Let me take a very simple example. Take a Dirac. So for the one at the back, that's a Dirac. Okay. So the Fourier transform of this is 1. You can take another kind of object, which is a chirp. So what is a chirp? It's a sine wave whose frequency is going to increase linearly with time. OK? Take the Fourier transform of that. This signal and this one have nothing to do one with respect to the other. OK? Take the Fourier transform of this, kill the phase, and what you'll observe is that oops, the modulus of the Fourier transform is 1. In other words, if you've lost the phase, you cannot discriminate a Dirac from a linear chirp. When you lose the phase in Fourier, you lose information. Now, why is this a very important topic and not just of mathematical interest? Is that in many imaging devices, such as crystallography, um, microscopic imaging, you are acquiring a wave, which basically is the Fourier transform of the objects that you are imaging. But it moves too fast, and your detector cannot measure the phase. It just measures the modulus of the Fourier transform. So for all these imaging situations, it's very important 
to try to recover the signal despite the fact that you've lost the phase. So what do people do? They try to put some further constraint on the problem. One constraint is to say, well, the object I was looking at has a compact support. So you can ask the question, if you know that your signal has a compact support and you know the modulus, can you recover the phase? The answer is, in one dimension, no. In two dimension, the answer is yes, but it's a strange yes, because it's completely unstable. That means numerically you cannot do it. You cannot do it, but very often you can recover something which does make a lot of sense and is not so bad. That kind of situation are very extreme. So the fact is, it's a good imaging uh, strategy to try to uh, do microscopic imaging by recovering the phase computationally. Now, are we in the same situation? It looks like because we lost the phase and we want to recover it. However, there is a big, big difference, is that this transform is very redundant. The Fourier transform is an orthogonal transform. When you lose something, you really lose it for good, basically. Here, these co wavelet coefficients they are not the coefficient in an orthogonal basis. There is a lot of redundancy because I haven't subsampled. So you have two pieces of information. You have the fact that you want to recover a signal which is a wavelet transform whose modulus is known. But it's a wavelet transform. That means that it must satisfy a certain type of redundancy. That means that what you want to recover is going to belong to a lower dimensional space than the overall space of coefficients, that's a redundancy. And if you put together the two constraints, then you realize that, in fact, the solution is unique. Okay? So in the case of the wavelet transform, thanks to the redundancy, you can recover the phase uniquely from the modulus of the coefficients, hence the theorem. Now, that's what I was saying. You have your signal. You apply the wavelet transform, and as you can see, you had one curve, now you have many curves. These are the modulus of the wavelet coefficients. So these uh, uh, curves are redundant. Using the redundancy allows you to recover. So then the question is, how do you do the recovery? So that's the problem of recovering phase from modulus. The problem is this is a very non-convex problem. The constraint on the modulus is not a convex constraint. So until basically last few years, all the algorithms were greedy iterative algorithms, uh, having different names in different communities. In signal processing, it's called Griffin and Lim. I mean, in other communities, some other people had discovered it differently. So there are many names. However, they're all the same. You have two constraints. You basically do an alternative projection on your two constraints. However, one constraint is not convex. So at one point, you are going to be stuck, and you stop. Now, there are ways to approximate this problem by doing an SDP convexification. Uh, that's the work that had initially been developed by Emmanuel Condes and the whole group. And now there are further algorithms uh, doing that. And once you do the convexification, you can get out of these local minima, and you can indeed recover the signal very precisely. So the good news is that this operator is invertible. Now, it's invertible, but again, I said it's not completely stable. There are certain types of signals that can lead to some instabilities. However, if you are in a situation where your coefficients are sparse, you have no instability. Now, why? If your coefficients are sparse, that means that the modulus of the wavelet transform will have many zeros, and so you'll have kind of spikes like that, OK? What does that mean? That means that the phase that you want to recover, you only need to recover them here, because this is 0. So if it's 0, you don't need to recover the phase. In other words, the number of phase you need to recover is much smaller, is basically equal to the size of the support. You have less parameter to recover. The inverse problem is going to be more stable, and the solution much faster. So that's something very important here. Step, sparsity plays a key role for the inversion, and I'll, mean, I'll explain what that implies. OK, so suppose now that you invert your operator. So you have the average, the layer before. You apply the inverse of u. You recompute the next layer. And then from the next layer and the averages, 
you invert the operator u, you get the next layer, you invert again u, boom, you recover x. So basically, it's a cascade of inversion of u. Now, why it doesn't really work? The problem is, the only thing that you have is the output, and at one point, you are going to stop. So, the last layer, you don't have it. Because you don't have it, you can say it's zero, because it was very small, but that means you are going to introduce an error. And if your inversion is unstable, when you introduce an error, it can produce a big error here. And that's where, again, sparsity is very important. Sparsity stabilized, that means despite the small error that you have here, from all the coefficients that you have, you can invert. So, very important. Sparse means more stable. What does that mean? That means that if you can reconstruct your code, which is only built out of invariant, entirely specify the signal. So despite the fact that you've obtained few invariant coefficients, if you make sure that your representation was sparse, then all these sparse signals can be discriminated. So sparsity plays as a key role, and I think uh, Hilton, Hilton had spoke about disentanglement for sparsity. It's another way to view it. It says that as long as your signal is sparse, you have enough information. But the very strange thing is that it's sparse there, but the output coefficients you are using are not sparse because they are average. That's why these things are very strange, because the inner node are sparse, but the outer node, in other words, the code that you use for classification is not sparse, but the fact that the inner node were sparse means that the outer node, the invariant, carries enough information to discriminate all your sparse signals. Okay, I'm going to show you examples. Okay, I'm going to try. Oh, that has gone out. That was the original signal. Yeah. I'm going to show reconstruction out of just the first order coefficient. So out of the first layer of the scattering coefficient. That was not the microphone. That was indeed the sound that it produced. Basically what you heard is a kind of Gaussian signal with a spectrum which changes in time. Da, da. So the window was about three seconds. So it changes slowly because the invariant is only on three seconds. So as time goes, it slowly changes. Now I'm going to show you what you get if you include the second layer, so the second order coefficients. So that's to show that, in fact, most of the information here was in the second order layer. So it's very important to get these next layers. And also, they provide sufficient information to reconstruct, at least in these cases, the original signal. OK, so I'm going to use this occasion to make few remarks about sparsity for, uh, for learning. Again, that's a little bit of a confusing topic. So in our case, what are we doing? We are computing convolution of our signal with wavelets. And as I mentioned uh, yesterday, this can be viewed as inner product of your signal with a whole family of wavelets, which are the wavelets with all possible translations. So view that as a big dictionary. And you can see that as a sparse representation if many of these coefficients are zero. And as I mentioned uh, yesterday, this is what is so-called an analysis representation in the sense that you take your signal and you compute the inner product, you correlate your signal with all the elements of the dictionary, and this is very stable, no problem. The problem is that we don't, if we want to learn, we don't know the wavelet in advance we want to learn, we don't really know how to learn a represent, an analysis representation, in other words, a family of vector such that the inner products are going to be sparse. What we know very well how to learn is a synthesis representation. 
So what is a synthesis representation? It's a representation where you decompose x on few vectors of the dictionary, and what's supposed to be sparse are the decomposition coefficients. Okay? And how do you learn that? You've seen several talks speaking about that. Well, basically, uh, there is a square here. What you want is that x is well approximated by a linear combination of your dictionary vector. And you want your dictionary vector to be sparse. And for doing so, you will impose that it has a small L1 norm. So you minimize uh, the L1 norm of the co coefficients. And you want to optimize that in order, in other words, find the dictionary that is going to minimize this quantity. So there is a lot of black magic about how to do that. There is basically no result about the fact that you can indeed converge to the optimal solution and so on. But the fact is, it does work very well. And with current algorithm, you can uh, learn dictionaries which provide sparse representation. OK, so you can solve this problem. But in this kind of feed-forward deep convolution net, what you are interested in is not this but you want a representation where what is sparse is the inner product of the signal is each vector. However, if this is sparse, if you plug that here, very often the other one is also sparse. And that's the kind of strategy that is being used by uh, many algorithms, in particular uh, autoencoder, as far as I understand them, which is basically you learn with a sparsity criteria like that, and then you take your dictionary and you use them not by approximating the signal with this decomposition coefficient, but you compute the inner product with the element of the dictionaries. And as I said, if this is sparse, this is very likely to be sparse. So that's what you're going to do. Again, the good thing is that this is stable where these coefficients are unstable. These coefficients are unstable. However, these even if you were using that, the instability is not so bad because if you remember, what you are going to use at the output are averages. So the averaging is stabilizing. So what all this says is sparsity makes a lot of sense. Oops. Sparsity makes a lot of sense to learn the vectors because it will make sure that your invariants are informative, that you can discriminate the different elements. And there are ways to do that by doing a sparsity of the analysis, even though synthesis, or even though you will use it within the analysis. So as I said, it's very confusing because there are different ways to use the sparsity. And the reason why the sparsity is useful is not because the final code is sparse, because the final code is average or you had a max pooling, but it's the intermediate code which is sparse, which means that the final code is informative. OK, so that finishes the uh, first part on reconstruction, which basically shows that a lot of information is within this representation. You can basically reconstruct, but there is still a lot of very open questions around that. OK, now I would like to look at the application to texture, texture discrimination. So as I mentioned last time, the difficulty of textures is that even though the object you are looking at is relatively simple in the sense that it's a realization of a stationary process like that, these processes are very badly understood because they are not Gaussian. They have long range dependencies, so they are not Markovian. And there are basically no mathematical models to describe the diversity of these type of objects. The fact that they are not Gaussian, as I mentioned last time, immediately appears by the fact that these textures or these ones have same power spectrum, which means they have the same covariance. So if they were Gaussian, they would be identical. OK, so these are other examples I had shown. So, you have a stochastic process, x of t, which may be time or space. So for any position, this is a random variable. And now you are going to compute the scattering transform. So for doing that, you apply your operator. What does it do? It takes the signal, make a convolution. If x is stationary, x filtered remains stationary. 
Now, if you have, so this is, remains a stationary process. Now you take the modulus. If you take the modulus of the stationary process, it remains stationary. So if you cascade modulus convolution, modulus convolution, and so on, at the end, you get something which is a nonlinear transform of your original process. It's still a stochastic process. For t fixed, it's a random variable. And it will remain stationary. What does it mean that it remains stationary? It means that if you take the expected value of this quantity, it's not going to depend upon time. So let's compute the expected value. And this will be called the, the scattering transform, or the expected scattering transform. The difference with what we looked at last time is that last time what we were doing is we were doing an integration in time, OK? An average. Now, the average corresponds to the expected value. So that's the expected, the scattering transform. It doesn't depend upon time. It just depends upon the path. In other words, what's the success, successive wavelets that you use to do the convolution, OK? And the question is, can you characterize your process from these coefficients? Same kind of questions when, that you ask when you say, I take a stochastic process, I compute the covariance. It's the expected value of the product of the process and its translate. Can I characterize the process from these expected value, the covariance? Yes, if it's a Gaussian process. No, if it's not a Gaussian process. Well, same question. But these are very nonlinear measurements. What can we say if we just measure these quantities? Now, there is one observation, is that as opposed to covariance, these quantity depends upon high order moments. But in a very strange way, it's completely renormalized. So the good thing that it's the fact that it's renormalized, why, OK. When you're facing a problem where second order moments are not sufficient, the immediate reaction is to say, well, let's go to higher order moments. In other words, let's compute the correlation between the signal multiplied by, for example, its translate at some higher order power. And there is a very large literature about that. It's called cumulant, high order cumulant. And there has been many, many papers. And it has been basically useless in signal processing. Why is it useless? Despite the fact that the mathematics is very nice, you have beautiful results. Because you cannot compute these high order moments. You cannot estimate them. The problem we have is that we have one realization. You have one texture. And you have from this texture to find what it is. In other words, compute everything about your process from one example. It's a bit like you are taking a dice. You throw the dice once. And from a single throwing of the dice, you have to know the probability of all the faces. However, here we are helped by the fact that we're, we are stationary. There are some ergodicity property. But high order moments, to compute them, you need many, many examples. Otherwise, your statistical estimators will have a large variance, means basically they will be non-informative. So the whole questions in these areas is how to have measurements which depend upon high order moment, but which have estimators which are, have a low variance. And for doing that, what you basically don't want to do, you don't want to take any power. You don't want to amplify variability. You want to reduce variability. That's what will make sure that your estimator is good. And that's what we're doing, because here this operator is a cascade of contractive operator. So that will be very important for the ability to estimate processes. OK, now, in practice, you cannot compute this expected value. As I said, you have one realization. So what are you going to do? You are going to take this quantity, which is here, and you are going to average it with your window. Well, that's exactly the scattering transform that we looked at last time. It's a successive convolution with wavelet, and at the end, the averaging. So in deterministic world, you are building something which is invariant to translation. In a stochastic world, you are building an estimator for an expected value, which of course doesn't depend upon time if you are uh, stationary. So you have an estimator which is unbiased of this expected value. And in fact, it's a consistent estimator with a fast uh, convergence rate. OK. Now that's the work of Joanne Brunat, among many things that I've described uh, before, so who is a PhD student at Polytechnique.
So the question now is, you have all these expected values. <coughs> and what you wonder is whether you can characterize a texture with that. One way to check that is to see whether you can reconstruct. Can you reconstruct the texture from these measurements? Now, why is this question different than the previous one? The previous one, I was taking one signal, and I wanted to reconstruct exactly this signal. In this case, I don't want exactly to reconstruct. So for example, I pick Gaussian white noise. What I want is not to reconstruct exactly the same signal, but something which looks like the same signal, the same texture. In other words, I want to reconstruct a realization of my random process. So what you have to begin with are expected values. And what you would like is to entirely specify the random process which has this expected value. But that's the only information you have. Now, what do you do? In statistical physics, that's a very classic problem. You have a set of measurements, which are basically expected value. What you do is you define the random process which have the maximum entropy given these values. That the fact that you maximize entropy is a way to say, I have no other information. Now, you have the well-known Boltzmann theorem, which tells you if you know expected values and you want to find the distribution which maximizes this expected value, this distribution is just going to be a Gibbs distribution, the exponential of something. And this something is just a linear combination of your expected value measurements, in this case, the U of P of X, the successive filtering with wavelets, filtering uh, modulus wavelets, and so on. So that's your P of X. Now, what you have to do is, given the measurements, you have to identify the coefficient alpha p, which are basically Lagrange multipliers. And the coefficient, the, the factor z here, which is the renormalization factor, which is also called uh, the partition uh, constant in physics, is just there to make sure that you can normalize your probability distribution so that it makes one. So there are standard algorithms to do the, that, metropolis hasting algorithm, but it's a nightmare. It takes forever to converge. So what people do generally are more ad hoc algorithms. What you do is basically you begin with a distribution which has a very large entropy, maximum entropy, Gaussian white noise. You pick a realization of your distribution, and you compute the coefficients. And then you progressively modify this distribution in order to adjust the expected values. So it's a gradient descent which begins from a realization of a Gaussian white noise. Now, how do you do this gradient descent? It's interesting. The way you do it, you have to modify. It's not so easy to have this kind of algorithm converge. You have to modify your texture, basically, to progressively adjust the scattering coefficients. But what we saw is that the scattering coefficients are basically linearly dependent upon deformation operators. So the way you do it, you take your texture and you progressively deform it in order to match the coefficients. And that's what the gradient descent is doing. It progressively optimizes the deformation so that at the end you have exactly the right scattering coefficients. OK, I'm going to show you examples. So in these examples, I just I have a signal of size n, which is very large, several tens of thousand points. And I only have log n square coefficients, so very few coefficients to describe this texture. So there is no way I'm going to reconstruct exactly the same signal. What I hope is to reconstruct something which looks like the same signal. So I do that in audio here. The texture comes from Josh McDermott. And that's the work of Jean Brunat and Joachim Ende. Oops, sorry. Forgot to plug it in. So that's the first signal. OK. Now I'm going to show you what is reconstructed from these expected value. And it's going to be a sound. You see, you can basically not distinguish it. Okay, that means that somewhere you've reconstructed the realization of an appropriate process. I'm going to give you a second example. Reconstruction. A third one. Reconstruction. Okay, so it looks very nice. 
is it always as nice? And the answer is no. You can, once you understand exactly what you're doing, you can construct counterexamples where the reconstruction will not sound as beautiful uh, as it is here. So the question is, are these counterexamples relevant uh, for the applications? Up to now, in all the examples we had coming from real sound, it looked good. But again, it's not a theorem. You can build stochastic processes where, which are not going to be exactly reconstructed. And that's not surprising. Look, you have many few coefficients to characterize your stochastic process. Uh, that's an example on image. So I show you a single example because that's the only one we were able to convert. You know, that's the thing in image processing, when, whenever people show you examples, you always have to wonder why they don't show you another example. And so let me tell you, it's because it doesn't work on the other example yet. <laughs> so uh, like that's you, you know it in advance. But that's the goal. The goal is to be able to specify potentially put other priors, and here the type of other priors we are putting on and trying to enforce, which is not always so easy, are sparse priors. So these are ongoing work on these issues. Okay, now I want to look at the second side of this problem, and the second side of this problem is classification. So texture classification, so now the problem, you have a signal, a realization of a stochastic process, so these are the simplest example. White noise, but two different white noise. This is a Gaussian white noise. This is a Poisson process or a Bernoulli process. So they are completely uncorrelated. That means that the power spectrum is constant. Their covariance is a Dirac. So second order moments don't distinguish them. That's the scattering transform. So in red, I show the first order coefficients, OK? In green, second order coefficients, so the output of the second layer. In blue, the output of the third layer. These basically corresponds to high frequency, medium, lower, lower frequency. In violet, the fourth layer, okay? Now, same thing for Gaussian process. What you observe is that for a Gaussian process, all the energy is basically output in the first layer, and there is very little energy going for the second layer. You may still see there are a few green spikes and almost nothing in the third layer and so on. If you look at the Bernoulli process, there is a lot of energy in the second layer, third, fourth layer. And that's in fact related to the sparsity of the original uh, process. The decay across layer is slower when the process is more stable. But the important thing is that they are completely different. They are completely different and with a single realization, you have a very good estimator of the expected value. So how are we going to recognize stochastic processes? In this domain, you cannot subtract the two signals because two white noise, you subtract them, it doesn't give you zero. It gives you a lot of energy, so it's meaningless. However, in the transform domain, we will just subtract the scattering transform because it gives you expected value, so it's not supposed to depend upon the realization and it will distinguish the fact that these were two different processes, and if you have two realization of the same Gaussian white noise, it will give hopefully exactly the same signature. So it's very trivial, you just subtract, measure basically the Euclidean distance. Okay, now another important thing, when you begin to try to understand the property of the uh, scattering coefficient, is that you immediately, re well, immediately, it took us quite some time. You, after some time, end up realizing that the information is not so much in the coefficients, but in the ratio between coefficients. So what you really want to compute is not the coefficients, but the ratio between the coefficients. Now, the ratio between coefficients exactly corresponds to a renormalization of your transform. How do you compute coefficients which are this ratio instead of having the original operator which was computing the average and the wavelet coefficient? You compute the wavelet coefficient divided by the average of the signal. So in other words, you renormalize each time your transform. And that could very well be related to the fact that all these operators used in deep neural network within each layer use a renormalization. When you use a renormalization by averaging with the other coefficients in the neighborhood, basically you don't anymore compute 
coefficients, but ratio of coefficients. And indeed, these are the elements which do characterize the stochastic processes. So uh, let me say, I make these statements, but these statements, uh, there is a lot of conjecture, a lot of things that basically we don't understand behind that. What we did is we began to work on particular, so in order to try to understand this kind of thing, you have to pick a particular example. Now there are classes of stochastic processes which appear everywhere in the nature, in nature, which are multifractal processes. These are processes whose realization are very irregular. For example, if you take a turbulent fluid, there is a lot of singularities, a lot of irregularities. If you take uh, marble, all kind of uh, uh, even uh, the trees, uh, the sorry, the leaves of a tree, if you look at as it, the texture has been modeled with uh, multifractals. So the question is how to characterize these multifractals. So we began to work on first order uh, coefficient and renormalize second order coefficients. And what appears is that the decay exponent characterizes basically these uh, random processes. So that's again ongoing work, but that's just to say that there are a lot of very interesting relation between all this work that is currently done in uh, convolution network and very different fields in science, namely in physics, where these kind of processes do appear within the physical, uh, within difficult physical problems, such as, for example, as I said, turbulent flows. Okay, now let me go to um, application for classification. So for classification, I'm going to use here, or rather, Joanne Brunat has been using exactly the same algorithm as for the one he developed for MNIST. In other words, a simple PCA. I just remind you, you take the uh, points of your classes, you map them within the scattering domain, and in the scattering domain for each class, you compute the affine space which best approximate the training signal within your class. Class one, you get one space. Class two, you get a second space, and so on for each class. And then you pick a signal, x, you are going to map it in the scattering domain, and then you just classify by computing the distance with all the space and finding the space which is the closest one, and you'll say it belongs to that domain. Now, as I explained, is that this space is informative. In the case of MNIST, this space basically gives you the set of all deformations of the class one. Okay, so, What's happening for texture? We're going to apply that to a standard uh, texture database, which is called uh, Curet, that was put together by uh, Malik in uh, Berkeley. So these are textures with different rotation, different illumination, 61 classes. For each texture, you compute the scattering transform. The window was optimized with the same uh, uh, algorithm which basically test all windows and then cross validated. However, you know in advance what's the good window. You have a stationary process. The best window is the largest one. It finds the largest one, so it's no miracle, but you, but you, you could set it in advance. So that's the scattering coefficients of the first order. Basically, it gives you the power spectrum of this, but average over large frequency cells. And the second order coefficients, which gives you a lot more information. Now you take these coefficients, you just send them to your PCA, compute the distance and classify. So the result that you get with a Fourier spectrum is not so bad. You get an error of the order of two percent. Where does the Fourier spectrum messes up? Whenever you have two textures which have exactly the same power spectrum. That doesn't happen so often. Only two percent of the case, but it does happen. Other techniques, there has been a lot of algorithms applied to that. The state of the art was supposed to be Markov random field. There was uh, an algorithm by Varman and Disserman. But in fact, if you do your Fourier spectrum well, you get a better result. But you stay around 2%. With the scattering transform, here we get a factor of 0.2%. So we have a factor reduction of the error by 10. Why? Just because these cases where you have exactly the same power spectrum, 
you can discriminate it with the second order coefficients. And with the PCA, you get it relatively easily. Uh, we did that also for uh, genre classification in audio. So genre classification, you know, you have a, a, a signal, and, which is a music. And what you have to find out is whether this signal is jazz, rock, blues, pop, and so on. So there is a database which is called GTZAN. And the standard features that are being used by most people are so-called MFCC, male frequency capstrol coefficient. They are the equivalent of the SIFT in audio world. And if you just apply this naive uh, PCA classifier, which is really naive, okay, you can do much better with uh, other classifiers, even GMM. You get of the error of the order of 32%. The scattering transform at the first order is about the same because they, it provides basically the same uh, information at the first layer. Second layer, you can reduce. So that's, again, this illustration that you have to go deeper. OK. That's, so that's basically for textures, stationary textures. Now, what I would like to do in the final part is to look at the third topic, which is this issue of more invariant. Can we work only out of translation invariance, or do we have to put more? We obviously know that we have to put more. And I'm going to look at cases which are not yet too difficult. OK, you have two sounds here. And the question, if you look at the, at the spectrogram, is are they the same or are they different? Let me zoom into a part. OK, is this the same word than this? So you can zoom and look. Encyclopedias. OK, second. Encyclopedias. Same, but one was a man and the other one was a woman. OK, so that's a source of variability because the locutor are changing. And that's one, of course, of the difficulty of all the problems of speech recognition. So you want to kill this variability if you want to do speech recognition. So same words, but different people. What is happening between a man and a woman Generally, the pitch of the woman is higher than the pitch of the man. What does it mean? The sound is higher. It means that basically the frequency are going to move towards higher frequency. So now you are ha having a translation not in time, but a translation along log frequencies. Okay? A frequency omega is going to go to alpha omega. So if you look at the log of the frequency, it's going to be log of omega plus log of alpha. So you have a translation along log frequencies. So what you would like is now to have translation invariance, but not just in time, but in time and log frequency. OK, that's the problem. So these are the wavelet coefficients. You see, you get a picture in time and log frequency. OK. So if you want an invariant, you can basically apply the same kind of technique that we did for images. You want a translation invariance like that and like that. The only thing is that in this case, there is no such thing as rotation. It doesn't make any sense because these are not two independent variables. So what are you going to do? Well, to compute in an invariant, again, it's easy. You just average. But if you average, you lose information. So how to avoid losing information? Compute wavelet coefficients. Wavelet coefficients, now we are going to use wavelets, but which are products of wavelets in time and a wavelet in frequency. So these are the different wavelets. You see, the size of the wavelet in time and in frequency are two independent parameters. They just correspond to independent phenomena. So we are not going to use squares, but rectangles with arbitrary width and lengths like that. These are the wavelets. So you take your image over there, and your image, which in fact was computed by doing a convolution of the signal with the wavelet, you make a convolution with your 2D wavelet, and now you're going to get a result of time and log frequency. So these are the 2D wavelets. You translate them all over, and you make a convolution or an inning product. Same thing. Then you want to build an invariant. Well, how do you build an invariant? You average the result of your convolution. That's what is symbolized there. How wide is the invariant in time will give you the invariance in time. 
and how wide in frequency will tell you how much do you accept translation in frequency without saying it's two different phenomena. So you make the averaging. And then you cascade. You average, you lost information, so you get the next layer and so on. So you see, basically, it's the same thing. It's the same thing because, you see, when you have a group, you can always view a group, as long as it's a Wendy group, like here, uh, frequency transposition, as being a translation. And so you apply your wavelet, but now your wavelet is not translated in time. Your wavelet is translated in frequency. You do the convolution, you average, do the convolution with wavelet modulus and so on. What's the result? We just tried that kind of thing on this database. It does improve a bit, but nothing spectacular. We went from 16 to 13% for uh, genre classification. Now I'm going to show what's happening for images. So that's the work of Laurent Siffre, uh, who is also doing a PhD. So that's a database which is much more interesting in some sense than the previous one uh, that was, I think, put together. I don't know who, who did that, UIUC database. Textures, but these textures have now a lot of variability. You see, there are rotation like the previous one, but you also have different scaling. You see, that's the same texture, but with different scaling. And because these textures are mapped over 3D surfaces, you also have affine transformations. So here, you have to deal with translation invariants, rotation invariants, scale invariants, affine invariants, because all these correspond to the same texture. So what you would like to do, take your signal, build something which is translation invariant, rotation invariant, affine invariant, and hopefully do that with a scattering transform. Basically build an invariant relatively to all these groups. So if you think to make a last uh, relation with physiology. In physiology, as I mentioned, there are these hypercolumnar structures, simple cells, which basically give you something like wavelet coefficient or rectified wavelet coefficients. Okay? And they are all organized such that wavelets having different orientation are concentrated around these pinwheels and different scale. What we are basically going to do is instead of doing a spatial convolution, as I did for images, we are going to do a convolution in this whole space, so a convolution relatively to position, relatively to rotation parameters, relatively to scale. So it's basically a convolution in this 4D space. So you begin with your signal. First thing, you do a standard wavelet transform. So what is this standard wavelet transform going to do to you? It's going to, I don't know why I write because nobody can see. So, you take your signal X, and, or maybe I will try to write one thing in very big. And you are going to do a convolution with a wavelet. Now, this wavelet is indexed by rotation parameter. It has a scale parameter, that was my lambda. And it has a certain position uh, T that I call. OK? So now you can view that as a function, I hope someone can see something, of position, it's a 2D variable, angle, theta, and scale. So it's a function of four variables, OK? And this function of four variable, we would like to build an environment relatively to these variable. In other words, we would like to average along these variable. But we don't want to lose information. So we are first going to compute a wavelet transform, but a 4D wavelet transform along each of these variables. It looks complicated, but it's not. It's just a filtering along one variable followed by the second, third, and fourth. So it's not. So that's the first layer, computing that. And the second layer, will be just a 4D wavelet along space, rotation, scale. Then you do your modulus pooling, so you are averaging. Uh, sorry, modulus, you kill the phase. And then finally, all the coefficients you have, you average them. Okay? Linear averaging, 
and that gets you your scattering transform. So it's a two-layer transform, but the second layer is not just invariant in space, it's invariant in space, scale, rotation. That's it, basically. And if fine. And if you do that, that's what's happening. If you just do translation invariance, the error is 15%. Why only, why you get an error? So I'm saying translation invariance 15%. Why do you have a big error here? Because there's a lot of variability you didn't take into account, which is in particular rotation uh, scale affine. If you do rotation invariance, then you go back to 3% error. If you do an affine invariant, you go to 1% error, and there you have the state of the art on this database. That shows that really, in these cases, variability is the thing that you want to take care of. The problem is not being afraid of losing information. In fact, if you do carry uh, the next layers, you don't lose so much information. But killing variability is the secret in order to do this kind of classification problem. So that's how you can work on groups. Now, one, uh, one thing. Can you do this kind of thing by learning? Maybe. But the point is, there is no reason to learn these. These groups, they are the same whatever application you will have in image processing. Translation, rotation, scaling, affine, that's due to the physical environment. It's independent from the applications, so you can plug them in, they are wired in. Then the question of learning comes in because you want to reduce variability due to the specificities of the classes. So I would like to finish on these specific question of uh, unsupervised learning. Uh, basically finish by saying I don't have much to say about it because I don't understand it, but I think it's a very beautiful problem. Not only it's a beautiful problem, but there are a lot of algorithms that are working well, and we've seen uh, that through the different talks. So the problem here is that when you get out of this like heaven of groups where there are not so many groups, they are all well known, they are all classified, you don't know the source of variability in advance that you need to reduce. And then you need to learn it. So the question is how to learn this source of variability and how to learn building invariants which are still stable and still informative. So the big difference from a mathematical point of view is that you're not going to be in a group anymore. A group has a very rigid structure. The way you can view a group, it's a manifold, but it's a manifold which is flat. In other words, if you unwrap your manifold, you can, it's identical to r to the power n. Okay, so it's a flat manifold. Now, generally, if you are lucky enough, you, after doing your scattering, your data lies on a manifold, uh, scattering relatively to space, rotation, and so on. But it's certainly, or after applying several layers of your neural net, but it's certainly not going to be a group unless you are incredibly lucky. However, locally, if you look at your manifold, it's locally behaving like a group. Locally, you can flatten it out. So the problem locally is not so different. And since in this kind of technique, we are using wavelets, in other words, waveform which are local, there, is, there is some hope that these kind of techniques can be extended to manifold. Okay, another important thing. A big part of the environment is provided by the averaging. Okay? So the averaging is a linear operator. The linear operator is very easy to learn. You can learn it with an SVM, you can learn it with a PCA or with any other technique. What is very hard to learn is the nonlinear part. The nonlinear part is the dictionary which built the inside nodes and the pooling, nonlinear pooling operator, which in our case, what was the pooling operator? The pooling operator was the killing of the phase. What does it mean that you kill the phase? That means that you take two coefficients, you decide this is now the real part, imaginary part, you take the square and square root. In other words, you've been pairing the two coefficients and saying these two co coefficients are very correlated, I want to kill their relative phase. Here, I knew in advance which were the coefficients that I would want to pair together. When 
you have to learn, you have to learn which are the coefficients that you want to pair together and that's are the uh, issues of grouping at the same time than building sparsity. So the problem is unsupervised learning of dictionary and of the nonlinear pooling. So there there's ideas that are around that Jan has been working on and uh, I think uh, maybe other people I don't know but by uh, doing uh, sparse uh, um, sparse uh, uh, grouping and these techniques again seems very promising however it's very still very complicated to, to understand how it behaves. The, for me the, the, the big difficulty is the following. Strangely enough you cannot learn a group. You, I mean you, in what sense you cannot learn? Learning a group is a very high dimensional structure and it's very complicated. You would need a lot of data. However, what we need is not to learn the group, we need to learn an invariant on the group. And to learn an invariant requires less information. I don't need to, if I know the group, I know how to build an invariant. However, I don't need to know entirely the group in order to know how to build the invariant. So that's in that sense the problem is subtle. One has to understand exactly what has to be learned and what has to be learned is less than learning the whole manifold or learning the whole group. Okay, so why all these techniques works? There's a lot of intuition, but uh, it still remains a mystery. And uh, that I think is a very, very beautiful topic uh, of research. Okay, so the conclusion of all this. There are some basic principles that I think come out from that type of work. Uh, the first thing is that as long as you're network is a convolution network that means somewhere that you are dealing with a group what is a convolution that means that you are translating along a structure which is uh, a group structure now if it's a standard group such as translation okay when you are dealing with a group if you want to have something which is completely stable to the deformations on your group there you don't have much choice your wavelet, your filter have to be wavelets. And why is that so? Because in order to deal with deformation, you have to separate the different scale. And that's exactly what a wavelet transform does. So you may choose this wavelet or this one or this one. It's not so important. However, you need to have this multi-scale structure. And the wavelet is built by translating your wave function on the group. The second thing, if you want to do pooling, it does make sense to do it with a modulus, square root modulus. And there, there are some uh, mathematical arguments for justifying that. And the averaging is probably, maybe not, but let's say up to now, the only operator I know that will give you an invariant which is stable. Why multilayer, as I explained, multilayers in this context is important in order to grab the information that the previous layer has lost by doing the averaging. Why sparsity? Because you are building invariant, which means that you are losing some information. Now, if your signal was sparse, despite the fact that you lose information, you can recover your signal. Because these are very particular signal relatively to your representation. So if you are sparse, you can still discriminate. If you are sparse in the signal world, you can be reassured about the fact that you have enough information for discriminating your signal. Normalization, it nowadays appears about everywhere in all these algorithms. There again, I think there's some very good reasons. In the case of a scattering transform, it appears by the fact that the information is not so much the value of the coefficient at one layer, but it's the ratio of the value. You can view that as a propagation phenomena. You know, when you have a wave that propagates, for example, uh, in uh, underground, in the underground. Uh, what is the information about the rocks? It's in the way the wave is going to propagate. In other words, in the transfer function that is within the propagation phenomena. Well, here you have about the same thing. If you think of your signal going across the network, it's like a wave propagation. It propagates across the networks. And what is important is not so much the value at the network node, but the ratio of value, the way the propagation has been going on. Learning, 
it's of course very important, but it's not needed for the very first layers. And that's something, of course, that now people realize. That's why very often these networks are not anymore applied on the signal to begin with, but on SIFT. In some sense, as I said, SIFT can be viewed as a first layer here. What I'm saying here is that you can go beyond. Use second order coefficient, because if you use SIFT, you have to be very localized. Otherwise, you lose too much information. Well, basically, you can in advance implement the filters as wavelets if you want all these environments and then for all the other layers you need to learn. So as I said learning unsupervised learning not understood mathematically but very beautiful algorithms around so there is a lot to be done. Uh, for anybody interested there is a website that we've put together where we have papers, softwares and small tutorials and uh, so that's the address of the website. And that concludes the whole thing. Thanks very much.